Let's call the school board meeting to order. George, can you take vote? Sorry. Uh, Colonel Evans? Here. Mr. Grozan? Here. Mrs. Ludwig? Here. Mr. Miko? Here. And Mr. Mesa? Here. Stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> At every board meeting, we talk about our, our district goals. The first goal is student achievement. Second goal is financial prudence. And the third goal is community engagement. And everything we do in this meeting will reflect those goals and our commitment to them. Uh, with that, uh, that moves us to public comment. We don't have any uh, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Nay. So uh, we do have two items. The first is approval of the 2018-19 and 1920 school calendars. Uh, we did meet with Polaris uh, last month. We did agree based on that discussion to move our spring break uh, to the final week of March and the calendars in Exhibit A uh, reflect that. Um, everything else in the calendar has remained the same. Um, so that is there for your consideration. Um, and before we move to the discussion item, are there any questions about the calendar? I do have a question. Um, what does this mean is the seniors last days and how does that in, um, affect prom because usually prom have coincided with their last day of school and if we've already signed up for prom is there any no, this doesn't no changes to the seniors last day the by state law seniors can have three less days than uh, the other students so that will still be the plan uh, prom will still be in the similar plan and for the 19 18 19 school year we have confirmed uh, with CSU, there's been debates about whether they're going to keep that set. They're going to keep it for one more year. At least they've committed. So uh, Sunday, June 2nd at 1 p.m. has been confirmed for our commencement. So uh, all traditional timelines for prom, last day of, for seniors, commencement are in place. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I just want to comment that I did get a chance to talk to Bob, Bob Timmons, the uh, superintendent at Polaris. And, he extends his uh, thanks. Uh, the meeting, uh, from his perspective, went really well amongst all the uh, all the school districts. Um, other than other than the school districts that have construction, and we all understand uh, how uh, construction and those timelines can bind you. Um, everyone is uh, in agreement to make sure the spring breaks work with the home districts and Polaris. And uh, Bob mentioned we're meeting again in May to start planning the next round and make sure that that, uh, that collaboration continues. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on the calendar? Nope. Okay, with that, um, as we talked about uh, earlier in the school year, we wanted to have a focus for each of our work sessions, a topic to discuss. Uh, March is financial prudence, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Anagnostu to uh, take it from here in terms of the presentation for this month. George. Thank you, Mr. Rabo. I'm just gonna make my way to the podium. These will present. So as Mr. Reimer mentioned, um, this month uh, for the work session, the topic was financial prudence finances. So I wanted to give a little update where we are on the five-year forecast and what it means moving forward. Um, it's a slide that may look familiar from the five-year forecast. I updated as of February, but it's our cash balances to, to where we are um, today versus where we could have been if we didn't have the reduction of the TPP dollars. So as you can see in the blue, the blue line, that's where our current cash balance is. Um, for fiscal year 18, we're projecting about, uh, about a little over $20 million, but it's going to be dipping down the years to come. And then in the fiscal year 22, we're going to have a deficit. Uh, with a TPP reduction that, that occurred in the 2006 biennium budget, um, we, we lost $3.6 million annually. And um, the difference and what the impact is is the difference between the two. So if we would have had that $3.6 million on an annual basis, our five-year forecast would have been a positive for the next five years. And at 2022, we would have had a surplus of $15 million. So you can kind of see where that, that difference is from 2022 to a uh, close to $4 million, $5 million deficit to what would have been a close to a $15 million surplus. Um, so just a reminder of financial prudence that we've done through the years to be um, financial, pr fiscally prudent as, um, 
as her dollar has been um, as her dollar has been reducing, but also fiscally responsible. Uh, we've increased our investment. We changed our investment strategy, which we've increased our general fund interest by one hundred six thousand dollars from fiscal year seventeen to sixteen, and that's that's increasing even in this fiscal year. So, as um, what we did there is we kind of tiered our investments. We looked at short term, long term, and uh, intermediate to when do we need our funds, when they're available, rather than just having everything in one sweep account. We kind of were a little bit more strategic on how we invested those dollars to get a better return for our investments. Um, fiscal year 14, we switched to a self insurance health care plan. Uh, since 2014 through fiscal year 17 that has saved the district a cumulative of $4.6 million. And then we've been financially trans transparent in the recent years as we've received, uh, we've been recognized by um, the Ohio Schools, Asso the Association of School Business Officials International for their Media Meteors Budget Award, also that same organization for their certif Certificate of Excellence in Financial Rep Reporting, the CAFR, uh, the Government Finance Organization, the, gov the Governmental Financial Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the CAFR. Excuse me, George, yeah. before you leave that slide, I'm sorry, oh, are you finished? I think it's important to note that the money we invest is not just money we have laying around. It's money that we get periodically from taxes and comes in a lump sum. And instead right. of just letting it sit there as we disperse it, we invest it so that we get some interest on it while we're waiting to use it. That's correct. Okay. And then in in November of 2017, based on um, the efforts that we've done in the past, our bond rating increased um, from a AA3 to a AA2, which helped us with, uh, with the interest rate that we went out for our bond refunding deal, which with a net, pro with a net present value, we saved $723,000 to the taxpayers by that bond refunding. And George, <coughs> that? Yeah. $723,000 is a reduction on the tax bills of each individual um, taxpayer in the city of Strongsville. So it's not as if we're getting it and we're seeing the savings. That is a reduction in their bills. Right. So they're so seeing it immediately. Not immediately. What, what will happen is it reduces our debt liability. So as we're paying off, as we're paying off the debt, as the money's coming in, we're paying off the debt. And then down the road, we'll be able to pay, we'll be able to do another refunding and another early defeasance. So by the, by the time that the bond savings done, it's going to save the taxpayers dollars because with these early payments that we're doing, it's less interest we're going to pay down the road and it's less interest we're going to have to collect. And the, and the, so it is going to be a direct savings to the taxpayers. Okay. Not immediately, but it will come in those years that the interest is being reduced. Okay. Thank you. So, um, to continue the cost saving efforts that we've had since 2010, the district has eliminated six buildings, repurposed one to save resources and maximize educational offerings. As we know, we closed out in 2010, it was demolished in 2013. Uh, this building closed in 2015, it was repurposed in 2016 as an administrative office. We've also uh, demolished or repurposed, demolished or sold other buildings, Drake, Albion, Center the OPS building in the old board office in June of 2016. And then since 2009, as our enrollment has declined by 22%, so has our employees. We're 199 less positions uh, since 2009 compared to this school year. Um, as mentioned, it's keeping pace with a declining enrollment. In 2016, uh, we reduced 24 positions. And then fiscal year 17, reducing nine positions as we closed buildings and repurposed. And then other cost-saving efforts. Uh, we opened up the Ohio Online Learning Program in Strongsville Academy to retain our to retain our students in the districts that would have otherwise chose other online options. So it's an online option that keeps the um, students in our district, and it saves us around two hundred thousand dollars annually, where those kids would have gone to uh, community schools. Uh, so what this means? This is our waterfall chart that we have in the forecast. So by having those cost saving efforts, as you can see on the right, um, it would have reduced our expenses. So our expenses through the forecast have um, increased through inflation and other inc increasing costs. 
such as the um, salary increases, healthcare costs. So we have we compete with those factors, but we offset our costs by the reductions that we have made. So if we would have done nothing, our forecast in fiscal year 2022 would have been 88.2 million dollars. But with all the cost saving efforts that we've done, we were able to reduce it. Um, right now, projected to 79.1 as of today. Uh, the five year forecast that I presented in September, uh, 2000, the current fiscal year we're in, 2018, we would have been deficit spending by 1.8 million dollars. In order to balance that out, we would have needed uh, budget savings this year, about two and a half percent. But as you can see, the out years, um, what was beginning to be troublesome as we were deficit spending in those years, as our, our as expenses were slowly going up, but as you can see, our revenues are going down because that TPP has fully come off uh, beginning this fiscal year. I have updated our forecast. Well, with this forecast, we're projecting a deficit in 5.6. That deficit spending is unsustainable, and our cash balance would have got us through four years, but then it would have bottomed down in 2022. Um, for this presentation, I updated our five-year forecast. However, I do update it monthly, but don't share it on a monthly basis until the May and October forecast. But as we're trending as of February 20th, when I did this update, uh, uh, we are trending about the 2.5% budget savings this year, anticipating hopefully a little bit more as the year goes on. Um, so we probably will balance out this year, uh, reduce that deficit spending. But going into next year, again, it, it's starting. Um, we're going to deficit spend by 3.9 million. That's if we spend 100% of our budget. In order to balance out um, for fiscal year 19, we would have to have a 5.3 budget savings. So we were able this year and the last year to kind of get through with budget savings. But as those deficits start being higher, the budget savings <coughs> isn't going to close the difference where we're going to have to do something different um, to bring that gap. Because um, when, when I do the forecast, one of the things I look back on is the previous year is how far, what was the difference between the forecast to what we actually spent? And, the, and one of the benchmarks I use myself is to try and be somewhere between uh, three to five percent difference, less than five, but I also want the forecast to be accurate um, in the sense compared to the budget as well. So as where is, um, so I use that that benchmark about five percent, three to three to five percent. Um, so fiscal year 19, if we would have hit five percent, that would um, close that 3.9 million dollar gap. But as we keep going further, that's going to be unsustainable. <coughs> um, so and I know that if I can interrupt for a second, yeah. on the on the budget accuracy, in the past we've had we've always beat our budgets significantly, right? Mm -hmm. So we're kind of not fooling ourselves, just being overly conservative. And, <clears throat> and I know you've made efforts to take that, to, to get it closer. Right. You know, we never want to be, you know, take too much of the conservatism out because we want to be, you know, we always make sure we hit our numbers and we will make sure we don't get ourselves in trouble. Right. But um, <clears throat> the $1 million difference between the previous forecast and this one on 70 some million dollars, that's a pretty good number. That's, yeah. that's really accurate. And I know you've tweaked down some of your assumptions in the out years to try to keep that closer. Right. So I think, you know, we as a board and as administration, we can rely on these numbers now to make the decisions. This is reality, what you're seeing right there. Right. And it's not gonna get, it'll get a little better because we'll be, we'll always underspend our budget to some degree, right. but there's not that much room anymore to do it significantly. Maybe you take a million dollars out of there. So maybe next year, instead of 3.9, you're at 2.9, right. right? But it's still 2.9, it's not acceptable. Right. So we're gonna, we're gonna work at that and we'll talk more about how we're gonna do that. But these numbers are pretty tight at this point. And, and the biggest change we'll have in the expenses is always healthcare. Right, right now, healthcare's forecast has a 7% increase in the out years. Uh, previously, I had a 10%. That was one of the things I knocked down. Um, this year or last year, we didn't see an, an increase for, for calendar year 17 to 18. So that's always the wild card is um, healthcare and, and how those savings come in. So if we see a savings in healthcare, um, that 7% represents about 700,000. So that would have a cumulative effect, but that's always, um, Kind of, we've been pretty good lately, and it comes in cycles. So, um, it's it's one of those we we forecast to where we were into the industry standards, 
and we're self-insured, so it's always based on our claims. Um, so that's one thing we continue to watch. Now, in our 2020 plan, we had a, um, we had an objective to maintain financial management practices in a culture of budget consciousness that ensures focused spending, and we had three action steps under that. Uh, the third action step is developing a cost reduction plan, and the levy implementation plan showed components of the established evaluation criteria not be met. Uh, we have five evaluation criteria. The first is assessing true cash days. Um, and of the, so it's assessing true cash days that have 60 days of cash or more. That black line you see in the middle, that's our 60 day cash benchmark. It's about a little over um, $10 million. I know it's between, it doesn't show in the graph, but it's about uh, between 11 and 12 million. And the red graph, and the red line, um, the red border line going across is that zero, um, zero cash balance. So the blue, the blue line at the top, that's fiscal year 18. Then the other color lines going down are the out years of the forecast. So we start dipping below <laughs> that, that benchmark in December of 2021, and, or December of 2020 in January 2021 is when, in fiscal year 2021, is when we start dipping below our benchmark. In December and January, then January we get our, um, January, February we get our uh, property taxes and it bumps us back up, then we rely on that for the end of the, the fiscal year. We're in July of 2021, we'll dip below our benchmark. And then in uh, fiscal year 2022 is when we'll be going below, we'll be going into a deficit where it will first hit us in December of 2021 in January of um, 2022, and then we'll get our taxes, which will bump us back up, but we'll fin finish the fiscal year in deficit, and by law, we, we can't finish the fiscal year um, in a deficit. And what's important, the important thing is between um, our cash benchmark and the zero, why we have that 60 days, a session, true cash days, that gets us two months of payroll, two months of payroll, two months of, two months of bills. And where that's important is, as, as Colonel Evans stated earlier, our, our majority of our tax dollars come in um, essentially four months. We get tax dollars in July and August, and January and February. Um, so we hit a cash low in, in November, December, and January. So if we don't have that cash benchmark of assessing true cash days, it, some districts, and we've been there in the past, where you struggle to meet payroll in December and January, then you go out for a loan to get what's called a tax, tax anticipation notes. And that's somewhere I don't want to be, and I don't think that's somewhere anywhere else, anyone else wants us to be where we're, bar we're borrowing money just to make payroll. So that's why we have that benchmark of the 60 days, where we want to be conscious not to dip below that point. Another evaluation criteria is maintain annual unreserved cash, uh, sorry, maintain an annual unreserved general fund balance between five and 15%. Um, for fiscal year 18, uh, I'm sorry, that's five to 15% of general fund operating revenue. Uh, fiscal year 18, we're at 32%, then we start dipping down. Uh, in fiscal year 2021, 20, we're below 10%, we're at 83 and then at fiscal year 2022, is when we hit the deficit. Uh, the other, another evaluation criteria is year-end expenditures will not exceed revenues. Uh, expenditures will exceed revenues beginning fiscal year 19 and moving forward. Five-year forecast will project fiscal stability for two years beyond the current school year uh, based on our current projection. Uh, the, current the current projection deficit spending is not sustainable and our overall pu per pupil expenditures will be compared to similar districts and for fiscal year 16, <coughs> which is the latest data out on ODE, we are, our 12,785 per pupil is comparable to similar districts. We're kind of right in the middle, the districts we compare ourselves with. All right. And let's so remind ourselves that those, you know, those criteria that we have are all because they took away funding. It's not like our spending's out of control. Right. We're still being fiscally responsible. We're being good stewards of the taxpayer's money. We're doing everything we can. And we had this pretty well locked down to where mm -hmm. we were supposed to be. And then, you know, four million dollars a year of funding goes away, and that's compounded every year, and it, it adds up. So, <clears throat> you know, that's that's why those things are going 
going south on us. It's not that, you know, things are out of control. We've made commitments that, you know, we, we couldn't keep. We've written checks that, you know, it, 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 we've done everything that we had to do so far. Right. Now we've got a new challenge. We've got this $4 million coming out. And, um, you know, we're just going to keep, keep working at it and see what we can do. Thank you, Governor Kasich. Mm -hmm. And so as based on our evaluation criteria, we've hit a lot of these benchmarks on either looking for additional funds or cost reduction plans. So that leads me to the next point. It's either revenues or expenditures. Uh, starting with revenues, uh, revenue generating ideas, um, the first and the big one is uh, consideration of a new operating levy. Uh, our last new operating levy passed was in November 2007. That was 11 years ago. It's a continuing levy. It was passed at 6.5 mils. Currently, it generates about $9.2 million to the district. Uh, the, before that, the previous operating levy passed was August 2002, and that was 16 years ago. And that's our current renewal levy that was just approved a few years ago. And that's for six mils, and that generates about $7.9 million. Since 2007, which, when we passed that our last operating levy, we've seen an overall reduction of $8.6 million in the annual TPP dollars. So we've been mentioning that 3.6. That 3.6 was the latest phase to completely phase it out. But previous to that, we were receiving a total of 8.6. So to that point, when you think about it, the, the 8.6 that we were getting on an annual, we were getting 8.6 when we passed the November 2007 levy. So essentially now, those two net each other out. So really, the last, the last time we've Just theoretically speaking, we those two netted out. So with with that in 2002, the 7.9 is kind of the dollars we're kind of I won't say receiving now, but since those two netted out, those are essentially the new funds that the funds that we've yep. last it's time we essentially got new funds. Yeah, wash. Sorry, I didn't say it <laughs> much better. <laughs> it's a wash. Sorry. Um, also, since we got the levy in 2007, um, the district efficiency measures. Um, I've mentioned earlier, just kind of repeating, we've 199 less positions since that new levy. We've eliminated six buildings, repurposed one. We switched to our self-insurance healthcare plan, saved $4.6 .6 million. We opened the Strongsville Academy, implemented an investment strategy, implemented a student fee collection policy to increase fee collections. So we've, based on that, since looking at efficiency, we've kind of hit the low-hanging fruit and got the big ticket items um, to look at efficiency measures. Uh, with a new levy, poten potential new offerings that uh, we're, we're thinking about not just balancing the budget but looking else what we could also add. And these are just ideas that we're just throwing out for conversation. Um, for conversation tonight is just we could potentially have full-day kindergarten tuition free across the district. Increase extracurricular activities at elementary levels expand theater program at the secondary level, and open for other ideas. Um, and then also other, if not a levy, just exploring other revenue generating ideas. It won't be as big as a levy, but it's, it's something. Uh, increase full day kindergarten tuition and preschool tuition. Increase pay to play fees, um, full open enrollment as we discussed previously, and then just opening up to other ideas. So that's kind of, where we're at on, uh, on and those are just those. I mean, those are just ideas out there that you know. Right. Just it, it all has to be vetted and talked through, and certainly, you know, that top end of the list, you know, none of those might be there. On right. uh, the bottom end of the list, you know, the revenue generating could be there if if need be. You know, those are all kind of almost menu items on the bottom. You you, you know, if you use this, you pay this. If, right. You know, they're not just across the board charges. They're to, to people who. You know, we're using those services, and I'm not saying we have to do that either. And we're, we're going to continue to work uh, not to do those things. Yeah. But <clears throat> and these are just topics since tonight was a work session. Just get the conversation started. Yeah. Of um, just different ideas, and then on the next slide, what I did do is if if we decide to um, think about a levy, um, just some of the things that we need to consider is when we would go, how much, a continuous versus renewal how long do we want the funds to last when we think about the mills. Um, and this is just an example. I just 
picked it just to show a benchmark. But below is, I said, below is an example of uh, a six mil levy. It does not include any offerings if we were to pass it this November. So what that would mean is uh, we would receive, uh, a six mil levy would generate on an annual basis about $8.7 million. We would receive half of that uh, starting, next starting next calendar year, which would be half a year for fiscal year 19, so that would generate $4.3 million. That would get us through 2021 without deficit spending, and then 2022 we start the deficit spending, but on a cash basis, that will keep us whole until uh, 2025 and possibly 2026, and that's if these were budgeted at 100%, spent at 100%, and it's just an estimate of the expenditures, but just to show a benchmark of, and I just to give you an idea of what six mils uh, would give us. So those are just some things to consider. Yeah. And we don't know what's going to happen to the school funding formula, but every time they change it, it gets worse for us. So right. That's where, you know, I wouldn't expect them and to change it, and all of a sudden we would get a, you know, a windfall. It hasn't no. happened yet. So. And I'll repeat myself, and I've done this every time we've, this subject's come up. School funding's twofold. We've got current operating, um, current operating money, but we've also got brick and mortar money, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at that new brand new middle school and the renovations of the high school, taxpayers in Strong's will pay for 100% of every single nut, bolt, nail, piece of drywall, paint, every single thing else. When you go into communities like Akron, Cleveland, Youngstown, Cincinnati, and some of these other more rural districts, you know, they have to raise 10%, 10 cents on each dollar to get their new building. So, you know, the governor and some other people would like to say that we're an affluent community. Well, yeah, okay, so we're stable because we work hard at taking care of our community, but we had to pay for our own buildings. We, we didn't get those for free, and now you're taking money away from our operating budget, and, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I, I never realized that robbing people to pay Paul or redistributing wealth was a conservative belief, so. Again, I'll go on my horse every single time we have this discussion. There's two sides to the funding of school districts at every level, brick and mortar and your operating money. You make us pay for our buildings and then you take money away from us. Where you go to other communities that are not managed correctly, that are not supervised correctly, you give them 90% of their buildings for free and you keep on giving them more money. Just not fair, so. Um. And then if, if we were to go for a levy, is thinking about, as I mentioned, when we would go. Uh, just some current ballot issues that when we're gonna be on the ballot and just kinda um, thinking about if we were to go for a levy, when do we wanna go? So the current ballot issues that we're gonna have out there in the future is November 19, there's gonna be three board seats up on the ballot. And then after that, November 2021, We'll have two board seats, and then it'll be the first time we can go for a current renewal levy. Um, if that, if our current renewal levy does not pass in November 2021, um, we'll have another opportunity in May of 2022. And if not successful there, then our last and final time would be November of 22 for a current renewal levy. And then after the year after that, we would have um, three board seats up again. And then for this year, just to give you an idea on the filing deadlines, if we were to go this year, um, November 6th is a general election. August 8th would be the filing deadline uh, for that. And then we would need two board resolutions, two board approved resolutions uh, to go on the ballot. And we would have to do the first one by July 16th and the second by August 2nd. And then um, that was revenues. And if revenues isn't the way to go, um, then we would have to look at expenditures and it would, as my, we got the low hanging fruit to get that size, it would definitely have an impact to services, programming and staff. And then the second part of that is if we were to do it, when would we do it? Uh, we have that cash balance that I mentioned earlier. When do we start benchmarking it to, hey, this is start when we start need to make uh, some bigger reductions. So this was, um, kind of more get the conversation started. So that kind of wraps up my presentation. I'm open to answering questions or if you have any feedback. Well, I have a question. Um, if we're gonna go this year for a levy or those ideas, really Cameron, you're driving that 
that bus, right? I mean, you're going right. to organize and do all that kind of stuff. So when's that discussion going to happen? When do you want to sit down? I mean, is it a discussion item for now or is it a discussion item for later? I mean, what's your thought process regarding that? In terms of, you know, obviously in the very near future, we're going to have to start having a serious conversation about when we go for a levy because of all of uh, what George just shared. And, you know, I think if we look at any organization going based on the WASH concept that the last time we got new revenue was 2002, uh, it would be hard for any organization to have 2002 revenue and 2018 expenses and still be financially stable, which we are for a handful of more years, even though we're, um, you know, going into our cash balance. So what we want to what we want to ensure that we do uh, in, in recent history in the district uh, for a variety of reasons, we've gotten to that that 11th hour where we needed a levy to pass or programs were cut or members of this board had to make some very difficult decisions about what would be cut if levies didn't pass. And we've made a lot of headway and those are decisions that take years or impact that take years to rebuild. And so we want to be proactive with that. We don't want to wait to the 11th hour. So uh, based on where we're at, the finance committee's discussions and George's work, I would say within the next month or so, George and I will have an official recommendation for the board, uh, not in terms of if we go for an operating levy, but when we go and a, and a, a millage that we would recommend, as George said on that chart, um, you know, he's projected out what six mills uh, would look like. Uh, and that'll all be a part of the factors we, we take a look at. So uh, we're hoping, you know, before we get into the summer months, we'll have a clear recommendation uh, for discussion. And then as George said, and, and I know George and I like to, if you want to go back to the previous slide, George, real quick, uh, George and I both don't feel comfortable waiting to July and August. Those work, but it cuts it a little close. Uh, so we would be more looking at using the June months if we were going to go in November uh, that we'd plan backwards from there uh, that we would uh, bring it to the board for vote in, in June if that's the recommendation. Um, so that that's where we're at, uh, Mr. Roseanne, um, okay. and the recommendation will be forthcoming as to when. Okay. Now, we met with the Finance Committee last week, and um, what we did was, you know, we brought in some new members mm -hmm. to the Finance Committee. Um, we have, you know, we have a, uh, some, some good entrepreneurs in there, some good, you know, people, everybody has a different specialty, right? We brought some with food service experience, some with investment activity, um, <clears throat> real estate, insurance, I mean, all different, you know, different specialties. And what we did was we presented all this data to them, all the financials. We gave them big packets, and you could see their wheels were turning, and they were excited about it. And we let them, you know, we, we turned them loose. And we're like, listen, here's, here's your packages. Here's what you've got. Um, look, see what you see. You guys all run businesses or, you know, you're, you're, you're very successful people. And, and we asked them to find things. Look and see what you can find. Ask us questions. If something doesn't look good and they, you know, we talked about it in one of, in one of our criteria was if you run a deficit for more than two years and two of the gentlemen who run businesses, like, I would never run a deficit for more than a year. I would never go into deficit spending. So you guys shouldn't either. We're like, yeah, that's an excellent point, you know. We're going to work on that. And, you know, we had our reasons for, for wording it that way because we want to be knee-jerky about things we do with programs because, like you said, if you do something, it, it, it has such a, a long mm -hmm. impact. But we've got a, a group of individuals looking at our numbers just to have fresh eyes. And what I would envision is that we take that forecast that you have, the most, you know, the, the most accurate forecast that you have, the, the revised one, and I would say from there we would list some, you know, we, we talk with the finance committee, we talk amongst ourselves, we come up with ideas to save money, and we lay out any of those savings, and we roll them out for those years. And then we take a look at, okay, maybe, maybe there are some programs, some things we might consider adding in the future, things that are critical to our 2020 plan, um, you know, for education and things that we really think are critical, and we lay those in there. And then we take a look at it, and we, we lay in, you know, a six mil levy or whatever we think we might do. Or, you know, if there's enough of the savings, it's a four mil levy, or, it's a, or it is no levy. I mean, that's the goal, right, is to find a way to do this without going back to, to ask for more. But it just seems like at this point, after losing all the funding, there's no way to, it's gonna be very, very, very difficult to do. So, but I think as we do that, it's gonna be a combination of both. It's not gonna be, well, okay, well, we're just going to have to go out for new money, so we're going to add some new things in, and we're not going to save any money, and that's not the case. We're going to continue to scrub ideas and to come up with ways to be as responsible and as good stewards as we can with this money, and, uh, and then we'll figure out where, where it all falls out. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to your guys' recommendation. I know it'll be a thorough process. We're in great shape for this for a number of reasons. You know, one, 
Um, we do have a little bit of time. We're thinking about this way ahead from in the past, you know, when we get into a critical situation and I was here that night when we cut $8 million out of here and we're not gonna do that again, um, I hope to God. And, um, but now we've got all this detail. We, we've never had the kind of financial analysis and the kind of financial work that George, you and your team have put together for us. So we've got the tools we need to dissect this thing and to break it down into small chunks and, and we're not looking for all home runs. We're looking for, you know, $500 here, $1,000 here, $5,000, you know, and we'll layer all those things in just like we do every day. And, um, and we'll just see where we come out. But I think we're in a good spot. And I, I love the fact that we're thinking about it way in advance. And that gives us time. Because if you save a dollar today, this year, it's $2. By next year, it's $2. And then it's 3 And if it, you do that in, you know, the hundreds of thousands, that's how you get yourself out of this. So we're going to keep working on it. So I, have, I was just going <laughs> to uh, quickly yes, add, yes, yes. I want to always make sure that we remind ourselves it's not either or, it is both. And I know Carl said the same thing, but uh, I want to say it succinctly. Um, I don't want the impression that, well, uh, we're not going to be able to save as, as much over that we have before. And that's true. Um, the big savings, we've, we've accomplished those. But that doesn't mean our culture and our drive isn't to save the taxpayer dollars each and every day, whether it's, you know, we don't want to cut programs that are valuable, but we need to evaluate all the time. Are these programs serving a purpose? Just because they, they worked 20 years ago, we're going to reevaluate and make sure they, they serve a purpose today. If it's, you know, uh, we are a business. We are the largest business in Strongsville. Um, so that $70 million, if we can knock a half a percent off on our expenses, that's a half a percent. And we're going to, again, it's not either or. I think it's reasonable that it's time to look at uh, a levy and start considering that. Um, but it isn't, well, we, we, can't, we can't save ourselves out of the hole, so we're going to just knee jerk and go to new money. It's both. Um, we're going to continue to find ways to save. Um, I always look at uh, three pronged or three principles for whenever we ask the taxpayer to, to invest. Is it needed? We need to give that message to our, to our voting taxpayers when it's time that it's needed. Is it reasonable? I mean, we've had, I've, I've had those discussions or I've listened to those discussions where people would talk about a 12 mil levy or a 15 mil levy. That's not reasonable. We're not gonna, this board is not going to go out with something unreasonable. We have to be aware of, of the finances of our taxpayers and what they can reasonably handle. And then the third one, which is the most important to me, is that we can look, our, look each and every taxpayer in the eye and tell them that their money is not going to be wasted, that it's going to be well spent. And regardless of new money or old money, we're always going to make sure it's well spent. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. Thank you to the Finance Committee for all of their work uh, in getting that ready for tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, under curriculum, we do have one item overnight trip for Strongsville DECA. It is DECA competition season, so they will be going out of Columbus March 9th to 10th for the Career Development Conference. Uh, expenses are paid by students participating in the trip, fundraising, and career tech funds. And also, those students who qualify for the state conference are eligible to go to the National Conference in April, which this year is in Atlanta, Georgia. And with that, that ends the superintendent's report. Excellent. That brings us to the consent calendar. Um, all items with an asterisk get approved in one motion. Um, do I, in one vote, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Second. Thank you, Richard. Um, any discussion on any of the items? There's no exclusions, no modifications. George, can you take roll? Colonel Evans? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Mesa? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. That brings us to board policies. We have two first readings, revised policy 2340 on field and other district sponsored trips, and revised policy 5136 personal communication devices. Um, uh, brings us to board of education other. Anybody have any other? I George? Have a number of others. Um, we had a PTA meeting today, so I wanted to remind everybody that there is a Rocking at the Rec tomorrow um, from 6.30 to 9 o'clock. Um, on March 10th, Sarar, and I thought this was a really cool story, 
Um, Sarar's having their wing ding night at Slim and Chubby's. Well, to be able to get more adults there, um, they asked the high school and a number of different um, students from the high school if they'd be willing to babysit. So they had 30 volunteers. So more people are actually coming to Slim and Chubby's for their event because there's 30 different high school kids that are going to be doing some babysitting, which I thought that was a really cool thing. That's a great idea. Um, there is a resale event um, March 10th at, um, at the high school, I believe. Um, on the 14th, don't be a victim at, um, at the high school in the, in the gym. And then I do want to remember, remind everybody, oh, I'm sorry, high school um, April 20th at the local bar is having, uh, the high school is having their, the high school PTA is having their wing dig night. Okay. And then finally, um, May 5th, jockeys and juleps. Get your table, get your bow tie, and get your hats. Um, I do want to say congratulations to Richard Micko for being the president of Polaris again. So congratulations, Richard. Um, I want to thank our city council and Jimmy Carbones here and our mayor for working hard to get us our SO officer at our middle school. We know that priority number one is the safety of our children, so I greatly appreciate that. And then I had one other thing that came from the PTA, which I thought was really neat. Um, the Key Club has put together a program where they want to do a water well project um, for, now I don't have all the details, but they want to raise somewhere close to sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars, and they're asking for corporate sponsorships. Um, I've asked them to give me the information so I can go to Rotary because this is something that we do quite a bit. But what a wonderful idea, thought to raise money to help others for a water well project and for these children, because um, they're children, to come out and try to work hard for this. So I just thought that was a really neat thing to do. So. And that is my final other. All right. I've got one other. I just want to uh, wish our uh, wrestlers this weekend good luck. We have four, uh, four wrestlers qualify for the district tournament in Perrysburg this weekend. Um, David Graycall, Mitch Shuba, Matt Slavik, and Ben Bickle all going for uh, the districts this weekend. It's going to be a great tournament. The uh, Perrysburg, Perry's tournament is very similar in the old days. It used to be out in Menor. We called it the meat grinder because it is by far the toughest district in the state. And if you can get out of that district, then you are the best of the best. And so I'm looking forward to seeing these guys come out. And, we, and the other interesting thing about it is we have one 10th grader, two 11th graders, and one, one senior. So it bodes well for next year's team as well. Yeah. So good luck, boys. Men. <laughs> And what are the things, just going on the sports theme, Mr. Nay, so we do have right now, I don't know the score, but right now our Lady Mustangs Girls Varsity Basketball Program uh, is taking on uh, the Avon Eagles, uh, and I think this is the district uh, finals here tonight, so uh, we'll see how they do, but they've had a great run at it and see yeah. if they continue on in the playoffs. They're tough. Yeah, they've, they've had They're a great tough. season. Good team. So the boys team won against the Avon Eagles yesterday, so I'm sure that bodes well for the girls team and we'll have <coughs> two wins yeah. uh, in a few short hours. Yeah. And then I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, we have a program uh, through Polaris uh, called Project Lead the Way. Um, we have their engineering program in the high school and we have their, uh, um, their Project Lead the Way program in the middle school and Strongsville was selected as, or recognized as one of the distinguished, uh, distinguished districts of the Project Lead the Way program. There are only 31 di school districts in the entire nation um, amongst all the Project Lead the Way programs that received this recognition for this year. Strongsville is wow. one of them. And the other neat part of it is that all the other associate districts uh, within the Polaris Career Center we're all uh, recognized as distinguished districts. So six districts in Northeast Ohio uh, were recognized of that 31. So I think we did a great job. And uh, I wanted to extend my congratulations to the program, to the uh, teachers who do a great job, the middle school. Um, everybody really enjoys that program and uh, it uh, highlights uh, the things that we wanna highlight in STEM. Um, and gets kids, especially at the middle school, interested in those careers. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. All right. 
with that. Um, we do have need for executive session. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Uh, tonight, Mr. Naso, to consider the employment of a public employee or official to review negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees concerning their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment, and to discuss details relative to the security arrangements and emergency response protocols for the board. All right. Uh, George, take roll. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Naso? Yes. Mr. Brosan? Yes. Mrs. Lovely? Yes. Motion passed. Enter an executive session at 750? 750. No, no business afterwards, so 